Hello friends, welcome back to Dungeon Design in Zelda. Last time we examined Twilight Princess's introduction and first dungeon, the Forest Temple. Next up is the Goron Mines. But, as is going to be the case for every dungeon in this game, there's some important stuff to do before we get there. Now, last time, I admit that I did complain about just how much stuff there was to do before the first dungeon, and that it was a bit tedious to get through. However, despite the fact that there is nearly just as much stuff to do before this dungeon as well, it doesn't feel tedious the same way as that introduction slog. I think the reason for this is because all of that stuff feels like just milling about and doing chores while waiting for the game to actually start, whereas all of this pre-dungeon stuff actually feels like it's moving the story forward. You might note as well that in that previous video, I mostly complained about the stuff that happens in Ordon Village, not the things that occur in Faron Woods, or the Wolf Link segments. And that's for the same reason. I don't mind having lots of stuff to do before the dungeon, as long as that stuff is meaningful and engaging. Engaging, and I believe that this pre-dungeon section of the game nails that. So let's briefly summarize again. We'll emerge into Hyrule Field for the first time and be able to find some secrets around here right away, including a piece of heart and some of these golden bugs. Following the advice of Faron, we'll head east and come up against a wall of twilight just like before. Midna will pull us through and we'll have another Wolf Link segment. We'll follow the scent trail of the children who were kidnapped from Ordon and, after fixing this bridge, we'll find ourselves in Kakariko Village. Village. We'll meet Elden, the light spirit of this province, and once more we'll have to find all the shadow insects which hold the tears of light. I didn't really mention this last time, but as much as people complain about these wolf link sections, I really don't mind them personally. The game trails you through the provinces to get you acquainted with the general layout of the area before we have to do some more in-depth questing through these locations in Link's Hylian form. And we get some really great story moments to boot. In particular, we find the children safe here in Kakariko under the care of this guy, Renato. We also learn that there's some out-of-character hostility between the people of Kakariko and the Gorons of Death Mountain, which neighbors the village. The unusual tension unfortunately means that the Gorons aren't around to help defend the village, so when the village gets attacked, there's only three survivors. Renato, his daughter Ludo, and Barnes, who owns the bomb shop. Great! Don't forget to stop at this Howling Stone to call the Golden Wolf, but more on that in a moment. Once the Tears of Light are collected and we're back in Hylian form, there's some dialogue between Renato, Link, and the kids here. But in short, Renato wants you to take the kids back home, but the kids want you to help ease tensions between Kakariko and the Gorons. So we do that instead. Except that as soon as a Goron sees us approaching, he knocks us flat on our backs. Renato speaks to you again with both advice and a request. He says that only only one person, to his knowledge, has been able to best the Gorons in a test of strength in the past, and that was Bo, the mayor of Ordon. So he suggests that you go back and speak to him, and requests that while in Ordon we let the people there know that the children are safe under his care in Kakariko. Epona conveniently shows up, and once we've reined her in, we can ride back to Ordon and do just that. Fun but amusing note is that if we speak to Colin's mother, Uli, she'll be glad to hear that her son is alive and then she'll notice the sword on Link's back, saying that it was stolen by monsters, but that Link can use it since he got it back. Stolen by monsters? It was me! <laughs> When we speak to Bo, he'll reveal that he had beaten the Gorons once in a sumo contest, and teaches us the basics of sumo wrestling. Then he adds further that he was successful thanks to a secret. He cheated. He then gives us the secret to his success, the Iron Boots. And we're back on our way. Don't forget to stop by the spring here, so that we can meet back up with the Hero's Shade and learn the second hidden skill, the Shield Bash, which can stun enemies or reflect projectiles. We'll return to Kakariko, but then that pack of Bulblins are back, tearing through the village. They'll capture Colin after he saves Beth and run off. We'll pursue him and have this incredibly epic horseback battle with the Bulblins, which ends in a game of chicken atop the Elden Bridge. Triumph! 
I love it. Okay, now that Colin is saved, we can head back up Death Mountain. But before we head up the mountain, make sure to stop by this shop, which is now being run by Mallow. Here we can buy ourselves the Hylian Shield, which we're going to want before heading into the fire-filled dungeon. With the iron boots on, we now won't get pushed back, which means we can stop these Gorons that roll at us. Ha! Who knew that this random charging goat in the game's introduction would be a tutorial for all of this stuff? Side note, yeah, the iron boots definitely help here with keeping Link grounded, but even still, this just goes to show how strong Link really is. Even with the iron boots, any other person should have kept their feet planted, but had the rest of their bones snapped from the knees up trying to stop these Gorons. But but as we march up Death Mountain Trail, Link is able to not only halt these Gorons, but toss them aside afterwards like nothing. We'll reach this section where we'll need to use the Gorons to propel ourselves upwards. Just be careful because they'll straight up punch you in the face. You can actually stun them in a couple of ways. Either poke them with your sword, shield bash, or even roll into them with your iron boots. Then climb on top and get launched. Once we make our way up the mountain, we'll come to the Goron Mines and Entrance, but the path is blocked. I love how ready to throw down Link is here. Half a dozen Gorons are ready to charge at him, and he just throws his hands up, ready to fight. They'll be stopped by the Goron Elder, Gor Koron, who states that he's impressed we made it this far. The mines are forbidden to outsiders, but he could make an exception if we can best him in a test of strength. So with the iron boots on, we gotta sumo wrestle this Goron. Again, I know the iron boots help keep Link grounded, but seriously, how strong is this guy that he can slap and shove a Goron around like this? Once we've bested him and proven ourselves, he'll note Link's strength and ask for help. The Gorons have kept the fused shadow in the mines, per the request of the Light Spirits, but recently their patriarch Darbus touched the Dark Relic and was transformed into a grotesque beast. They've sealed him in the depths of the mine, and he requests that we go to Darbus' aid. So with that out of the way, and a clear objective, we can finally enter the dungeon. Welcome to the Goron Mines, a dungeon that, in my opinion, is severely underrated. While at a glance, having our lava-filled, fire-themed dungeon be the second one in the game may seem a bit tropey or cliché, this dungeon turns things on its head, both figuratively and literally. It expertly toes the line of adhering to Zelda traditions and formulas, while also introducing plenty of extremely creative and fresh ideas. It's a wonderful combination of old and new, which is executed nearly flawlessly. The the dungeon follows suit from its predecessor, the Forest Temple, by having friendly NPCs found inside, those being these Goron Elders who we'll encounter along the way. But unlike the monkeys in that previous dungeon, these guys play a far more passive role. They don't beckon you to follow them or guide you throughout the dungeon, so in a sense, the game is easing us out of handholding altogether. Though like the monkeys, they do provide you a way to the dungeon boss. As far as architecture goes, the mine is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. As is the case with many Goron-built structures, the mines are largely carved out of stone or built into caves. However, the Gorons have built plenty of metal structures using heavy girders, sheets of metal, and chains, including these impressive pieces of mining machinery, in particular these massive magnetic cranes and even Beemos. The Gorons built their own Beemos somehow. But they fit the aesthetic of this place so well. You'll also find enormous pipes and valves, giving a somewhat industrial feel to this place. The Goron Crest, as you'd expect, can be found stamped all over the place, including on those Beemos, 
on all of the doors and above many of the doorways. Curiously, in some spots, it's paired with some sort of text, but I can't seem to translate it. Whatever this text is, it isn't Hylian script. In addition to the many quarry-like rooms, there are the rooms where we'll find the Goron Elders, which have a different architectural style to the rest of the dungeon. These few rooms harken back more to the style of buildings we see in Ocarina of Time's Goron City, rather than the industrial feeling found in the rest of the mines. Clearly, these rooms serve a function other than mining, perhaps being spots where Gorons working in the mines could take breaks, hold gatherings, or possibly just use as storage rooms. The mine is also littered with deposits of this magnetic stone. These are spread across floors, walls, and ceilings, and can be used in conjunction with the iron boots to walk along any of these magnetic surfaces. This mechanic in itself is already just awesome, but as far as the dungeon layout goes, it helps set this place apart. We're no longer limited to just obstacles along the ground now, because the the dungeon is able to incorporate the walls and ceilings into its floor plan. If you recall, I previously mentioned that the forest temple made great use of its space, but the Goron Mines does this even more effectively thanks to this idea. Plus, it's just freaking cool, though it does bother me a bit that Link's hat doesn't always hang down properly, it does sometimes, but just as often doesn't. A glance at the map seems to imply that the dungeon is very simple in its layout, but this isn't the case thanks to its effective use of walls and ceilings. While we're often doubling back through rooms and backtracking, never does it feel like backtracking because of this shift in perspective. For example, the first time we go through this room, we're hopping around the stones and avoiding the lava. Then when we backtrack through the same room, we're hanging upside down on the ceiling, so even in its backtrack tracking, there's variety in its gameplay. The dungeon layout also appears like a huge loop with a few branching rooms, but this works so well for the dungeon progression as it always happens to bring you back right where you need to be, so the progression just feels so natural. The dungeon map is split into two floors, but there's hardly any overlap in those two floors, save for the dungeon's large central room. So really, it may as well be consolidated into a single floor map -wise. I do love, however, the way you return to this central room several times via its many doors, and slowly unlock more sections of the large room while also making shortcuts for yourself back if need be. It's another way the dungeon makes effective use of its space. You technically are backtracking when you come back to this room, but nearly each visit to the central room has you emerge onto some new balcony that you haven't been to yet, and then connect it back to the previous sections, so it always feels feels fresh and interesting. It's subtle, but brilliant. The dungeon's music is pretty low-key, all things considered, mostly featuring ambient industrial sounds. Most notably, the main tune that plays is actually the Goron lullaby from Majora's Mask. but with an increased tempo and an instrumentation that sounds like it's being tapped on metal. It's certainly, at a glance, not a very memorable dungeon theme, but I personally think it's sort of genius how it musically bridges the gap between the dungeon's industrial feeling and the Goron's culture. It's largely ambient, but it's well done. Alright, let's look at the progression through this place. We'll enter the dungeon in what I'll call this foyer room, but really it's more like a long hallway. We'll have to hop across the lava here, then down the metal scaffolding. There's a few instances of having to push these switches to extinguish the flames blocking our path, and we'll make our way over to the other end of the room. We can use the iron boots to weigh down this lever, which opens the gate. There's a couple of notable things in this room. The huge metal pipes, which seem to be spewing flames, are really interesting to me and make me wonder what purpose they would serve in-universe. There's a couple new enemies here, such as these tadpoli, which are like off-brand octorocks, and torch slugs, which return from Ocarina of Time. Through the door, will emerge into that large central room. In the center of the room stands a massive crane, but the platform is isolated from our position. From here, the walkway splits to offer only two paths. We'll want to go right first and down the ramp here. There's some bulblins to defeat, and a chest with our first small key. 
So now we'll want to head back up and up the walkway to the left. There's some rotating platforms to hop across, and we'll come up to a locked door where we can spend that key we just found. We'll emerge in the western room where we'll encounter this game's version of Dodongos. They retain their tail weak spot in this game, though they do appear far more gecko-like here. You can either try to hop around them to strike their tail, or just cheese the fight by spamming spin attacks, which have enough reach to hit their tail even if you're standing in front of them. The puzzle in this room is pretty straightforward. Forward. Make your way to the other end of the room and pull this chain, which drags this stone to open the path and then run over to the door before the path closes again. We'll come into this hallway filled with water, and the path here seems blocked by this metal fence, but there's a way to go underwater if we use the iron boots. There's a button under the water to press here, which activates this section of magnetic stone and pulls us upwards towards it. Now we can walk along the stone and around to the ledge so that we can reach the door. We'll now be in the far western room, where we'll meet one of the Goron elders, or a motto. He'll give us a key shard, which is one of the three pieces needed to assemble the boss key. There's also a treasure chest in here where we can find the dungeon map. If we climb up the ladder here, we can head towards the next door, but oh no. Uku? Alright, this door takes us back into that water hallway, but this time we're on the second level. We can cross the room using the magnetic walls on either side. Just watch out for the torch slugs. Next, we'll come back into the room where we previously fought those Dodongos, but on the balcony above the enclosed hallway from before. This switch here activates a section of the magnetic stone on the ceiling, pulling us upwards. Now on the ceiling, we can make our way over to the next door. But first, make sure to grab this treasure chest hidden in an alcove in the corner of the room for a piece of heart. Alright, as we make our way over, the magnetic section of the ceiling almost acts like a mini labyrinth in itself, but you should be able to make your way over to the other end of the room until you're hanging over this balcony, then drop down and head through the door. This will take us back into the central room, but on a new stretch of walkway leading over to the central platform. We can dispatch the bulblins and press this switch, which activates the first magnetic crane. It will oscillate, hovering over these platforms, so you can use it to return to the southern balcony near the dungeon entrance, as well as ride it over to the next platform. There's a switch here as well, which activates the second magnetic crane, which we can ride over to the balcony at the northern end of the room. Through the door, we'll come into this flooded room where we'll encounter some tech tykes. The way forward is blocked by this gate, and the gem switch for some reason can't be activated with the slingshot, so there's some puzzle solving to do in here. There's a chest at the bottom of the water, which contains a small key. We'll also see this gated off section of the room, which we can access through this opening underwater. I'm pretty sure you're meant to push this block aside, but you can literally just walk past it. It. Float up from here, and on this ledge we'll find a switch which activates another magnetic beam which will pull us up to the ceiling. We'll find a platform that we can drop down onto, and pressing the switch here will activate another magnetic beam which we can jump down into, this time pulling us to the wall here so we can drop to the ledge where that gem switch is. Striking it with your sword briefly opens the gate, but it's on a timer. Don't worry about getting locked in here though, there's a second gem switch on the other side of the gate. There's a couple bulblins and a pair of bemos who we can't yet defeat, but there's a strip of magnetic stone on the wall which we can walk up. There's a chest to the left with a piece of heart, so make sure to grab that, but otherwise we can reach this ledge where we'll cut the rope to this barrier which will drop down to reveal the next door. In the interest of avoiding the bemos, I recommend just dropping down here. Spending that key we found on this locked door brings us to this open air room where we'll find a pack of bulblin archers. We can make Make our way up the scaffolding here, avoiding the archers as we do. There's a door to the right, which is locked, but the key can be found by taking the path to the left near this beamos. Spending that key and heading through the locked door, we'll find this room with this large rotating bridge. We can get across here by using the iron boots to stick to these magnetic sections of the bridge when it flips upside down, then crossing carefully when it's upright. Just a side note, the patterns on this huge rotating platform are a visual treat and 
and I love it. Okay, we'll have reached the eastern door here, through which we'll find the room with another Goron elder, Gor Abizo. He'll give us the second key fragment and tell us that there's a useful weapon a little farther through the mines that was once used by an ancient hero and may be useful to us. Thanks, dude. We can climb the ladder and head through the upper door, and we'll emerge on the upper balcony of the rotating bridge room. We can reach the southern door via the magnetic wall here, which takes us to the mid-boss fight. We'll find this huge magnetic arena suspended over lava, and a Goron guard who is guarding the treasure that Gorabizo told us to take. He mistakes us for an intruder and initiates the battle. This is Dangoro, and I guess he didn't get the memo about us coming here to help. He's massive and is able to block most attacks, but I love this battle. Just be careful because Dangoro's punches are so strong that even blocking with your shield won't protect you. When he gears up to take a swing at you, he'll leave his stomach exposed to attack. Exploit this opening and you'll cause him to curl up and roll towards you. Just like we did with the Goron during our march up Death Mountain Trail, catch him as he charges at you, and toss him out of the arena. So long, eh, Bowser. Repeat this a few times to come out of this battle the victor. A side note, I know I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but how strong is Link that he can just throw this massive guy around? I don't care how heavy your boots are, this is all upper body and arm strength right here. Once we win the battle, he'll realize that we're actually here to help his patriarch, and he lets us through to the next room so that we can get the dungeon item. It's the hero's bow. Now, regarding the bow, this was, up until Breath of the Wild, my favorite favorite version of the bow in any Zelda game. It's so quick and snappy and actually very useful in combat as it can one-shot quite a few enemies. Because of its combination of speed and power, it outclasses the bows of previous Zelda games and even the bow of Skyward Sword easily. The bow was said to be used by an ancient hero and we might be able to figure out which one. First off, the name Hero's Bow is shared with a few bows in the series. However, looking at the visual design helps us narrow things down even further. All three of these bows share the metal risers near the grip. However, Majora's Mask's bow also has these little bits sticking out of the curve of the bow, which is present on this bow as well. Though the metal plating is a bit different here from Majora's Mask's bow, it's the wooden part which can't be replaced or altered as easily that is the same. So in my mind, this is in fact the very bow used by the Hero of Time during his journey through Termina. But that's theory territory, so let's move on. We'll arrive in this circular room surrounded by Beemos. They'll all be inactive until we try to approach the next door at the southern end of the room. They'll all awaken, but now that we have the bow, we can actually dispatch them by shooting their eye crystals. I really love this room as a bow tutorial, as these enemies are all stationary, so we're forced to get used to aiming with the bow before we can move on without putting us in too much harm's way. Once they're defeated, we'll be able to drag the Beemos out of the way of these alcoves around the room, which is hinted to us by these grooves in the floor. The alcoves have a few collectibles, but most importantly is this chest with the compass. There is also a side room here, where we'll find the final Goron Elder, who gives us the last key fragment, completing the boss key. Now we can head through the next door, where we'll get some more good use out of the bow. Knock this gate down, and we can proceed by hopping across across these platforms. I recommend just sniping all the enemies in this room before they can drop off the ceiling. The door is gated shut, like many of the gates we've encountered before. There's a switch here to activate the magnetic ceiling and pull us up. And we can use the bow to shoot this gem switch hidden in an alcove to open the gate. Now through that door, we'll emerge into the uppermost section of the main central room. You can shoot the rope to lower this bridge and use this switch to activate the third magnetic crane in this room. This will oscillate like the others, and we'll be able to drop onto the second floor balcony at the northern end of the room. We'll have essentially made a loop back to this point that we've been to before. But if you take a look at your map, the path to the boss room is a clear shot from here. So let's head north. 
pass through this flooded room quickly by using the bow to activate the gem switch and will emerge back into this open air quarry room. Now we can actually deal with the bulblins in here. Don't worry too much about running out of arrows either as you can farm the arrows that they shoot at you or find plenty of arrow restocks in the pots and barrels around here. Just a quick mention about this room, there have been plenty of optional chests throughout this dungeon including a stamp chest found in this room underwater here, but there is one particular chest in this room that you cannot get. It's on this ledge in the farthest corner of the room and it's completely out of reach without an item that we can't get until later in the game. I hate it. I hate it so much. Anyways, we can deal with that Beemos which was actually blocking a path just like the Beemos we encountered earlier. Following the path, we'll be able to activate the crane in this room, shoot the rope holding up this barrier while hanging upside down on the crane, and then head into the next room. There is something of a firefight with the bulblins in here, but you can dispatch them easily enough with your bow. Then one more barrier to lower, more bulblins to defeat, and we'll find ourselves at the boss door. When we enter the boss room, we'll see an enormous dark figure in chains. But reacting to our presence, the figure's power flares, and it easily breaks its restraints. This is Phyrus, the Twilight Igniter. Phyrus is, as told to us by Gore Koron, actually the Goron Patriarch Darbus, transformed by the Fused Shadow. Indeed, we can see what appears to be the Fused Shadow itself latched onto his forehead. Though if Gorons are made of rock, then Phyrus is what you might consider a molten Goron. His visual design as a dark figure set ablaze is truly stunning and equally imposing. I love it. Gameplay-wise, the fight does fall a bit short for me as it's a pretty easy battle, but I will give credit to just how creative it is. Phyrus will rampage around the room, but his attacks are pretty easy to avoid. Fun detail though, if you hide from him, he has a full separate animation for just looking for you. I love that. He's got a gem on his forehead and you can probably guess that that's his big glowing weak spot. We'll need to use our new bow to strike that gem, which will cause him to writhe in pain. This is where the fight gets creative. The floor in here is magnetic, so use the iron boots to keep your footing, grab the chain around one of his ankles, and pull him to the ground to temporarily subdue him. Once again, I'm saying it. How is Link this strong? Once we've forced him to the ground, we attack his weak point more directly. Rinse, repeat, and finally he will go down. Whew, that's a quick boss fight. It's kind of too bad that this fight is only one phase and it's really easy, but it's just such a visual spectacle. I can't help but love it. The gem shatters, breaking the curse on him, and we'll get the second fused shadow. Grab your heart container, Midna gives us a bit of exposition telling us about Xant, and oddly comparing him to Zelda, and Darbus will be returned to normal, though he has no memory of what's happened. With all of that done, we'll be warped out and urged by the light spirit Elden to head north towards the Lanayru province. So that's the dungeon. One thing has really stuck out to me during my playthrough of this dungeon, and that's just how much raw creative power went into the design of this place. I love how the lead up has subtly taught us mechanics that get implemented into the mid boss and boss fights. With the charging goats and gorons teaching us how to defeat Dangoro and pulling these massive chains, which is incorporated into the battle against Phyrus. I love love how we assemble the boss key in three pieces. You can even see that they have that magnetic stone inside to hold the pieces together. It's such a nice change of pace from the norm of just finding the boss key in some chest somewhere, and it just makes sense in universe. This mechanic of walking along magnetic surfaces is implemented into the dungeon so well and is expertly taught to the player with us activating a switch using the iron boots and being pulled onto one of these magnetic walls the first time. 
time, and then having that same magnetic stone stretch across the walls and ceilings of the rooms, then expanding upon this with cranes, magnetic beams going upwards and sideways, and a rotating bridge to stick to, a whole platform, and ugh, it's just so great how they took such a simple concept and kept expanding on it while keeping it so understandable. The bow as the dungeon item is a welcome addition, nice and early on in the game, but despite being a recurring item, its utility in this game is so great. I just love how quick and deadly it is. The overall dungeon layout looks so simple at a glance, but the rooms all make such great and effective use of their space. For the first half, when you double back on rooms, it's always from a new perspective, and then the one time you have to backtrack through the same rooms again without that shift in perspective, it's after obtaining the bow, which makes the retreads of those rooms much quicker and easier to pass through than before. The enemy variety is great. The mid-boss is just so bombastic and fun. The NPCs are helpful, but not intrusive or handholdy, and that boss fight against Fyrus, while perhaps being too easy for my liking, is an absolute beastly spectacle. This is one of those dungeons that in the past has rarely come to mind for me when thinking of my favorite dungeons, but upon this replay, I realized that what at first seems like a cliche repeat of what past games have done is really in fact a streamlined, creative powerhouse. I like it a lot. Thank you so much for watching this video, I just wanted to take a quick second to say thank you to the lovely people who supported me on Patreon as well as my channel members, particularly those who supported at the cheese level or higher, which includes Tetra, Brenda, Justin, Callie, Finley, Grey Mage, Hylian Historian, Gale, and Ethan3G. Thank you so much for the support you guys, and I will catch you all next time. Bye bye